Hi, I'm Peter. Um, I'm from Copenhagen in Denmark, and uh, I'm here to talk about how to make your web fonts load really, really fast. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I work... Oh, let me just try my clicker again. There we go. On a day-to-day -day basis, I work at a company called SiteImprove. Um, SiteImprove helps you optimize your website by measuring the quality. So we uh, scrape your website and measure things like uh, accessibility compliance, GDPR compliance, quality assurance, uh, etc. There's a lot of things in the suite. And I'm primarily focused on web performance uh, in SiteImprove. When I get home, I uh, play with my kid. Um, we play Fruit Ninja more and more often. It's, uh, it's really good fun. And uh, when she goes to bed, I spend some time thinking about open source. Um, so I've done tooling in, uh, in JavaScript and in Node for many, many years now. And I've primarily focused on build tools and workflow optimization tools. And many of these are performance related. So um, these last two years, I've been quite interested in optimizing how to load fonts and web fonts. So can I just have a quick show of hands? Like, How many of you have ever written a website that uses web fonts? That's quite a lot. Um, it turns out that actually in the world, there's a lot of people who do that. About 70% of all large websites actually use web fonts, at least according to the different statistics that we have available. And they do so for very good reason. Uh, web fonts uh, make you um, uh, able to control your, your brand experience. It, it makes you able to improve legibility. And it, it generally just makes it nice. right? Your designers probably want to be able to control the, the font experience. The problem is that if you just put a font on there um, in the way most people expect you to, it's really, really slow. So this is about user experience. Loading your fonts fast is about creating the best experience possible for your visitors. And the two key metrics that are important here is the first paint, which answers the question, is anything happening at all? That's when your page goes from blank to something. And then it's the first meaningful paint, which is the first time when the user can read your page and actually try to understand what this is about. And text is quite important to get a meaningful paint. So fonts have an influence on this metric. Uh, let's start out simple. All right, there we go. With uh, Hello World, people have all, uh, usually written Hello World a lot of times. Our Hello World example looks like this. Uh, this shouldn't be new to you. It's a basic HTML site. Uh, there is a style sheet. That is about the limit of it. And the next thing we're going to do is add a font. There we go. There's something with my clicker. I might, might need to switch later if it doesn't work. OK, so I'm adding a font using the Google Fonts service. Um, in this case, I chose Tangerine. I went to fonts.google.com, found it, copy-pasted the link that they, they told me to. And in my style.css, I'm also referencing uh, Tangerine in my heading. Um, and let's all share a user experience of before and after adding this font. So on the left-hand side, over here, you can see what happened before, the system fonts. And over here, you can see what happens when you load with Google Fonts. And you can probably immediately see that Google Fonts is quite a lot slower. And uh, the reason why it's this slow is that I'm running these measurements on uh, a mobile device that is uh, equivalent to a Moto 4G that is about three or four generations behind what I have in my pocket and probably what some of you also have in your pockets. And I'm running it on a slow 3G connection. I'm doing this because that is approximately the global average right now. So where I'm from, this is a very bad experience. In a lot of places in the world, this is above average. And it's important to think about how your th stuff gets perceived uh, for your target audience in different places in the world. So I'm going to walk you through why this experience suddenly became so slow compared to system fonts. When we have a look at the waterfall chart uh, of how the, f the resources actually load, you can see that when Google Fonts come in here on the bottom, a lot of extra stuff is actually happening. You can see that there is an extra CSS download happening here. That's the CSS I added from, from the Google service. And there's a font being downloaded over here, which is also the font from the Google service. And the reason things are so slow 
is that we're in a critical rendering path. So first of all, CSS, when I include it, is render blocking. That means that the screen is literally white until the CSS has downloaded. The fonts I actually don't start downloading until the CSS has all downloaded and the browser has constructed a render tree. That's the time where it figures out what CSS applies and thus what fonts apply to which glyphs. So the downloading only kicks off at like four seconds. And then obviously we can see that, ah, there we go, that the network conditions uh, make everything a lot slower. Most of this waiting time is just uh, idle network. So I'm spending time on making a, a DNS lookup, a TLS handshake, uh, actually requesting for the server, and the latency is affecting all of this. This is a really bad critical rendering path. And we need to see if we can optimize that. So again, this is the user experience. It takes four seconds to show anything and there's no text here, so it's not really meaningful. I can't read what this pa page is about. And then in about six and a half seconds, I get the text. The, m the meantime here is the flash of invisible text. The default behavior for a browser when it hasn't downloaded the font is to show nothing, which is not really useful. So this talk is about making fonts load really, really fast. And essentially, it's quite simple. We need to take this point over here and just move it up here, right? So the fonts are ready when the CSS downloads. So this talk is about that. There we go. OK, so first thing we need to do is take control over how we load the fonts. That means we can no longer let Google, in this case, control how the fonts are loaded. There is a, an awesome project called uh, Google Web Fonts Helper, where you can go in and you can type the name of the font that you need. It will give you a CSS snippet, which is uh, corresponding approximately to what Google would serve you. You can copy paste that and you can download the fonts and host them yourself. So that enables you to skip all the idle networking time that we just saw in the waterfall chart before. It looks like this. I simply copy pasted the output from the tool. I downloaded the fonts so the references are correct. And the result is quite staggering. The performance increase if, is several seconds. I think it's about three seconds faster. So on the top, you see Google Fonts. And here, down here, you can see that I'm not spending nearly as much time in, uh, in network idle time because I'm reusing the existing connection I already have to my server. In this case, this is HTTP2, so I'm not spending uh, extra time uh, negotiating uh, new connections. This is a massive increase. But there's actually more we can do than just that. You might see that. OK, there we go. It's jumping back and forth a bit. You might see that I'm still, I'm still idling a bit here. The fonts is, are still only downloaded once my CSS has downloaded and the, and the browser has constructed a render tree. And we can actually do something about that quite easily. There's a technique called preloading. Preloading means that uh, you can instruct the browser to prioritize something higher than it already does, or you can tell the browser that it needs to download something that it didn't know it needed to download yet. In this case, the browser has no clue it needs to download fonts. But I know, so I can tell it. And I can do it like this. There's a, a technique called resource hints. One of them is the ability to preload. So I put a link rel preload as font. Uh, I point it at the WAF2 version of my font. Um, I don't need to care about the WAF version because it turns out that preload support is a subset of WAF2 support, so this is safe uh, for all browsers that support preload. And then you do some cross-origin stuff in order for it to work. There we go. So the previous technique gives you like 70%-ish uh, uh, browser support, but you can actually increase that browser support. There is an API called the CSS Font Loading API, so with JavaScript, you can actually trigger uh, the older browsers that don't support preload yet to still preload the font whenever this JavaScript is evaluated. So this basically uh, runs through the fonts. And the specific fonts that I'm interested in, I trigger a load immediately. And this loads it also for older browsers. This puts your browser support on a global average of 86%. Let's have a look out at how that performs. OK, I'm going to press some buttons over here. There we go. Yeah, 15% extra browser support. OK, here's a comparison of, again, Google Fonts. The Google Fonts was self-hosting. And then we have the self-hosted fonts now with preloading added. 
And we can see that we gain another half a second on the time to meaningful paint. And that's a nice increase for just one line of code. I think it's one of the biggest benefits you'll get with just a single line of code. So I'm going to stop midway here and give you some takeaways, because this is the point in the talk where we're going from optimizing fonts to hyper-optimizing fonts. So uh, the techniques you've seen now, self-hosting your, your fonts and preloading your fonts, um, those are the best ones. They're the easiest ones. You can do them right now, literally in the break after this talk. Um, and then we're, uh, no, please don't, please don't, please don't. No, yeah, there you go. Don't, don't mess with the setup. <laughs> Um, so now we're going into to the hyper-optimization stuff, which um, you might or not, might not want to do, uh, depending on how confident you feel with it. So there's another thing here on this waterfall chart that you can see. The, CS, uh, the CSS is downloaded after the fonts. This is because I told Preload to, to let the browser prioritize the font higher. And the font is quite big, as you can see. And what's happening here is that the font is actually clobbering the network bandwidth so the CSS downloads later. I improve my time to first meaningful paint, but not my time to first paint. That is actually slower than just before. The way we can reduce the size of the font is by using a technique called subsetting. Subsetting means that you can take a font and reduce it to a, s a select a uh, group of, gl of glyphs that you know you need. Um, that's essentially it. You cut away the stuff that you think you don't need, and then you reduce the file size by doing that. Google already does this uh, on the Google font service. Um, it has a heuristic that says these, these glyphs are very likely to be used together. Uh, so in Belarus, it's probably likely that you will be using the, uh, the Cyrillic uh, characters and probably also the Latin characters. I'm more likely to only use the Latin characters in Denmark. Um, and when you send this down, um, it says that basically this file uh, covers these Unicode ranges, this other file covers these other Unicode ranges. The browser interprets that, and then it downloads only the select files that it needs. The problem with this technique is that the browser support is actually still not good enough that this thing can be sent to any browser. And the experience of a browser that doesn't support this is extremely bad. It'll choose either the first one or the last one. So there go your web fonts. Like, you cannot control that experience. Google knows this. So they have an application server that, when it serves you the CSS, it decides, based on your browser's capability, which CSS it sends down the wire. That's nice for a font expert that sets up a service like this. But I want to be able to host my things statically. I don't want to set up an application server to serve my CSS. So I'm more a fan of static solution. And there exists a static solution in order to get a subset. So this is a completely different technique called aggressive subsetting. Instead of using a heurist heuristic of what uh, characters are likely to appear together, I'm saying, I know exactly which characters I'm using. Let me put only those in the subset, which will make it smaller, but also more error prone. We'll get to that later. So uh, Bram, who's in the audience and will talk later uh, also about fonts, has written this uh, nice article that says uh, aggressive subsetting is an anti-pattern. And that is very correct, because the gains are, are good. But if you make just a single mistake, uh, the user experience will suffer quite a lot for it. And you can see an example of that here, where uh, somebody forgot to subset that nice character, which is also, this, this has literally happened to me also. I have a U umlaut in, uh, in my last name. So suddenly, you're not serving a nice experience. You're serving your audience a ransom letter. And nobody really wants that. And I can only imagine that you will have experienced this with Cyrillic characters and missing in different web fonts uh, here as well. So what we need is a technique that allows you to quickly load a font that is your proposed subset that you know you need, but also fall back if you miss a glyph. And this is a technique that I've come up with it myself. I don't know if this exists in the wild already. So I put a new sticker on it. It might be new. Who knows? In lack of a better name, I call it graceful superset fallback. And the technique basically says that I'm going to apply to my H1 both the f font family Tangerine subset and the font family Tangerine. The way the web browser uh, evaluates this is that it says, um, 
uh, if the cliff is available in the first font, I'm going to load that one. If it's not available, it's, it's going to fall through the chain. This is why you also uh, always end with a system font that guarantees that if the load fails, the user will be able to read something. So basically, this means that if I'm good enough at guessing my glyphs, then the browser will only load the subset. If I'm bad, then it'll load the original font. I'll lose some performance on that one glyph, but I won't serve up a ransom letter. And that's a nicer experience. So this means that it allows us to actually start playing with aggressive subsetting and see if we can get some performance out of that. So the most difficult question to answer about which fonts to put, uh, yeah, well, the most difficult question is which fonts do I even put in, in the different subsets in the font variants? And uh, luckily, Zach Leatherman has thought a bit about this problem. Um, and he created a tool called Glyph Hanger. Glyph Hanger boots up your web page and inspects the styles on it and it literally goes and gets computed style of every uh, single text element, figures out which, font, which fonts applies them to them, groups them by font variant, and then cre can create subsets for you of those font variants, which you can then go and put into your web page. So this is the performance difference that you get between Tangerine original font with preload and Tangerine the subset of only the Hello World characters. And it's a quite striking difference. It's like a cut another half a second of the time to meaningful paint. That amounts to 20% faster time to first meaningful paint. And that's 20% of the complete load time. Mind you that I cannot control what's happening before I download the HTML. That's the first two seconds are already gone there. So this is a massive improvement. The font literally comes in at the same time as the CSS does. In case the font doesn't come in before the CSS does, you can control the behavior. The default behavior is don't render anything until the web font is there. With a font display, uh, with the CSS font display property, you can control the behavior. You can set the browser to keep blocking. I wouldn't recommend that. Or you can set it to swap. So it'll first uh, draw a system font, and then it'll swap in for the web font once it's been downloaded. Uh, I highly recommend uh, watching uh, Monica Tinkulescu's talk on this. Uh, she goes really into depth on how the browser does this. So this is basically the list of techniques that I've been through so far. You can self-host your Google fonts to, to maintain control of how your, your things are loading. You can create font subsets in order to reduce the size of the load. You can preload them in order to like, preempt the browser's uh, later load. Then you can use the uh, CSS font loading API to improve your preloading support. You can use the graceful superset fallback technique to ensure that you won't uh, show these missing glyphs. And then you can use font display swap to improve your, your uh, per perceived performance uh, during the load of the page. Now, I'm a tooling developer, and I'm a very lazy developer. When I look at a list like this, I see, OK, there's, uh, there's one thing I can do one time. And then there's a lot of things I need to do literally every time the content changes on my page. Because if I update my copy, the glyphs will change, and the subset might fail. I need a robot to do this for me, because I, I don't trust myself, and I'm also lazy. So I thought about this problem. Can we automate these things? And uh, since I said I've spent the last two years thinking about this, I've also coded some things. So yes, the answer is you can automate some of these things uh, under specific circumstances. I built this tool called Subfont. And what it does is, like Glyphhanger, it inspects your page. It doesn't boot up a browser, but it, it does this fully based on static analysis of your HTML and your CSS. Uh, it does the same thing as Glyphhanger. It extracts like, which glyphs are needed for which font variants, creates the subsets, but it doesn't just stop there. It also injects the subsets into your page. and replaces, It essentially replaces your existing code in order to apply all of the techniques we just saw. The goal of this is to bring C uh, font loading performance to everyone. Like, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm lazy. I want to solve the problem of repeating the workflow that I already know how to do. But I also want people to be able to have fast font loading performance, even though they have no clue about all these co complexities that are under the hood. So essentially, I want a designer who is only just learning HTML and CSS to be able to use a web font and have a, highly, uh, a high performing uh, experience. So performance should be for everyone. And I want this tool to bridge the gap 
to everyone, not just to the experts. This is how you run it. Um, it's essentially a post process on your existing build step. So you build your static website using whatever, Gatsby, Hugo, um, Jekyll, or whatever people are using. You point it at your index HTML file, and you tell it to replace the, the content with the dash i. And then it goes and does the thing. Um, you can also subset local files. Uh, then you need a Python installation. It'll tell you. Uh, but this works out completely out of the box uh, with Google Fonts, for example. This is a complete comparison of everything we've been through so far. On the left, you have where we started, Hello World, with Google Fonts, downloaded Google Fonts, preloaded Google Fonts, uh, and then the last one is actually Panel 2. Google Fonts with the worst performance we saw, but the only difference is I applied my tool, subfont, to it. And you can see that the timing here, using Google Fonts and applying subfont, is actually not competing with any of the other techniques. It is at the speed of system fonts. It is not faster. It looks like it's faster. That's a network glitch while we were measuring it. This will literally never be faster than system fonts. But it will be quite fast. Obviously, not everybody is writing Hello World all the time. Usually, we write something that's slightly more complex. This is an example from my own blog. I'm using two different fonts with two different variants, like regular and bold, for, for each of them. And I spent a lot of time performance optimizing this already, but I was still running with raw Google fonts. And I actually got about a three-second performance increase for times of first meaningful paint. This is a massive performance increase. And that's just from, from running this one tool. I'm not the only one that's to think this is cool. Kyle, Kyle Matthews from uh, Gatsby, uh, which is a static page generator, he has been spending a lot of time optimizing the output of Gatsby. And even on his own page, gatsby.com, he's getting half a second uh, increase on time to first meaningful paint. So this is quite significant. And I think he's working, still working on a plugin for, uh, for Gatsby. It'll come eventually. So there's, there are some caveats. As I mentioned, that subfont is doing purely static analysis. This means that this tool will not work for you if you have any dynamic backend that serves up your content. So if you have a CMS that will generate the HTML based on each request, this is not the tool for you. This is the tool for you if you use uh, things like Jekyll, GitHub Pages, um, Gatsby, Hugo, Wintersmith, all these static page generators. There, there's a million of them. If you have a workflow that's, for example, static hosting like Netlify, all that stuff, this works out of the box. Um, if, you don't, if you're not in that situation, you can apply these techniques that I already told you about, but I would advise you maybe to stop after self-hosting and preloading because the consequence of an error is, is quite big if you, make it, uh, if, you, if you implement it wrong. So there's still a few caveats that we haven't solved um, in subfont. But those are actually general problems with subsetting, uh, yeah, in general. Um, so here's an example where on the top line I have uh, my normal font. I have some AV, AV, AV. And in the bottom line I have uh, the same example, but let's say only my A is in my subset font. And then I have the fallback experience where I load the original font, which gives me the V. The problem is that these are two different files. And information like kerning and ligatures are actually a part of like, the metadata in each font file. So when you have two different font files up against each other, these kerning pairs and, 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 and ligatures, they, don't, they cannot resolve that this should essentially be the same font. And what you get is that the A and the V are spaced slightly, slightly more. And I've put some boxes around it so you can better see that the, the glyphs are actually drawn completely separately. And the same thing for ligatures. If you have beautiful ligatures that a typographer has spent time on creating, um, like the FFI, and if the I is in a different font, you'll not get the ligature. Um, we have an idea on the subfont project how to deal with that, um, where we could, in the worst case, where you need to uh, download the original font and, and have that running, uh, then we would observe the load of that font and then actually remove the usage of the subset so, the, so the everything is rendered using the original font. And that would actually give you back ligatures. Um, that's on the roadmap, so we haven't solved it yet, but it'll come eventually. 
The last thing that you might want to control uh, during your font loading is that if you have a lot of fonts and they are loading slightly slower than your CSS, you might see this dripping effect where, OK, first it's drawing the system font and then immediately replacing it with a web font. And you might see this many, many times down the page the more web fonts you have. Um, if you're interested in controlling that experience and saying, I want only system fonts until all the web fonts are ready, and then I'm going to switch, then you can use a library called FontFace Observer, also by Bram, who's in the audience somewhere, maybe. Um, and you can basically say that uh, all of these font loads are promises. I can orchestrate the promises, and then uh, at a s at a s in a single switch, I can switch over to the CSS that uses all of these. So let's talk about what the future of web fonts is and web fonts loading is. Um, all of these things I've shown you here, the last ones, the hyper-optimization ones, these are all hacks. They're not, they're not things I would recommend unless you have tools for it or unless you have experts on your team that also know how to debug when something goes wrong. The good thing is that on the future roadmap of fonts, people are actually thinking about solving these problems in a way where you wouldn't have to use any of these techniques or any of those tools. Now, one of the interesting things that's on the roadmap is variable fonts. You'll hear much more about that from Bram. But the main difference from a, from a load and performance perspective is that where you previously would have to download multiple uh, font files to get different variations, like bold or italics or different weights, um, with variable fonts, you would download a single file, and then you would be able to adjust the properties of it. So that means that you've just reduced your amount of download. Uh, another interesting prospect is that uh, the W3C has a working group, the Fonts Working Group, which is uh, currently focused on attempting to create, I want to call it a streaming font. It's not quite that. But uh, the idea is to get the browser to tell the server during the request for the font which glyphs it actually needs and then uh, specify a standard that will let the browser actually send down literally the needed subset. And whenever the browser re-renders and needs more glyphs, it'll be able to like, amend the existing font. So that get, gets rid of the problems with kerning and ligatures, because it can basically stream in the new, the new glyphs as they're needed. Um, this is so much on the drawing board that it doesn't have a name yet. But uh, if you're interested in it, then take a look at the CSS uh, or the font working group uh, and their mailing list. I haven't so far because it's, it's too early days for me. But uh, I'm interested in uh, developing tools that bridge the gap, so make it backwards compatible so you can just use the newest techniques. Um, so whenever variable fonts have a good fallback pattern, I'll implement that in subfont so you can keep going and using that. So I hope you, if you're in a position uh, and have a static file, uh, a static page, that you'll go and use subfont and uh, give me some feedback on your performance increases. Uh, or if you find any bugs, that would be really helpful. I really want this to, to be a, a nice out-of-the-box experience. Um, if you're interested in web performance and in tooling in general and, and front-end development, you can follow me on Twitter. That's my handle. Uh, I'll tweet out on the, on the CSS Minsk.js hashtag later, so you can find me there as well. And uh, with that, I'll just like to uh, thank you for your time. OK, Peter, thank you a lot. We invite you to have a short interview with us. Thank you. Well, thank ah, you for your talk. This is comfortable. Yeah, it's a nice chair. <laughs> OK, uh, imagine you are a developer of Google Chrome. So how would you implement uh, font um, uh, loading in this browser? If it was up to you. If I'm, an, if I'm a developer of Google Chrome. So one of the things I've been missing while I've been developing all this tooling is any information at all about what the browser internals are doing. Um, this is literally black box development. I've been writing a technique, and then I've just been trying it and seeing what's downloaded. There is no feedback on uh, what the reason is why, uh, why a font is being downloaded, what the glyphs are. I would definitely uh, expose those I internals so people can debug their experiences. That would be really helpful. Yeah. So with all those tools uh, that we have, like uh, the one that you did, for example, we get really awesome results. But one downside is we have really slow build time. So yeah. what can you say about that? Is it bad, or should we bother about that? Well, well it, it's quite obvious this will increase your build time. Right? Um, 
The nice thing about this is it doesn't need to run in your development loop. So I, I tend to, to split it up to say that it's really important that you have fast feedback loops, but you don't need to do all the stuff in your development feedback loop. You don't need to minify or uh, bundle necessarily everything uh, if you can avoid it. And this is a post process on your production deployment. And I'm okay with adding a few more seconds, even minutes, if it's a big page, uh, to a production deployment because nobody's actively sitting and waiting for it. So uh, I would not put this in like your Webpack thing. I've literally not made it web Webpack compatible for that reason. Uh, it works on files on disk, um, which makes it perfect for a production deployment post process, but not slowing down your development round trip. Okay, so what was the biggest pain point for you with web fonts? What what was like the that almost made you insane? Like <laughs> it's it's definitely the uh, why the heck is the browser downloading this fallback? I th there's there's no way to get any insights right now, and um, I would really hope that that browser internals would be exposed at least just in dev tools or. Uh, even with a flag or whatever, I'm like I'm okay with diving a deep, uh, doing a deep dive there, because not everybody should. Uh, we should just have tools that that help us do these things. But it would be nice to know some browser internals. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.